Well, thank you, everyone, for, for thank you first for inviting me here to spend these two days with you. It's really an honor to be invited. And I have to say before I say what I'm going to say that uh, I was so impressed and overwhelmed this morning by all the great work that so many of you are doing. It's really, I, I, it makes me realize that, you know, I've been around in virology for over 40 years and every once in a while something that is in English we call it a game changer, something that changes the way we think about everything and this is one of those things. And um, it's exciting to be in the middle of this very tragic event, series of events. And um, I think that um, I'm hopeful that people like all of you will continue working very hard to bring this epidemic to an end. Now, I was asked not to talk about the epidemic, but just to talk about um, my organization, the National Institutes of Health of the United States, and the research resources we have that can be brought to bear on the problem of Zika and of microcephaly and other complications like Guillain-Barre syndrome. Let me say at the outset that the National Institutes of Health is an enormous funding organization. It's the biggest research funding organization in the world. Our budget every year is, I think, about $32 billion. That's B-I-L-L-I-O-N, billion dollars, uh, which is larger than the budget of the national governments of most countries, I think. So we have a lot of money, and we like to give it away. My institute is the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which deals with Zika. Some other institutes do as well, and our budget is a little under $5 billion a year. And as I'll show you, we have already begun handing out grants and contracts and other things to people in all over this region, in Brazil, a number of other countries, in South Central America, and potentially even in the Caribbean. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the areas of research that we're most interested in, and then I'm going to show you some examples. These are not complete, but just give you some idea. And I think many of the things that the speakers talked about this morning will have counterparts on these slides. This is another way to look at the same thing. Um, our research and development involves all sorts of things, from basic science research to clinical research, including epidemiology and population-based studies, uh, to vaccines, to drugs, to diagnostics, and to resources for industry. That can be banks of specimens. Um, all of these categories can potentially be funded. And I think I, I want to make a particular point that although the National Institutes of Health is a United States organization, Everybody in the world is eligible to get funded, not just Americans. Every organization, every scientist in virtually every country, except a few that we don't get along with, but that doesn't include Brazil, virtually every scientific organization can compete through grant and other mechanisms to get funding. And uh, uh, because of this, uh, everybody at NIH is very concerned about this epidemic, and we want to be able to help in any way we can, but we need you to tell us what we need to do. That's the way it works. The ideas come from the scientists, and we're looking to scientists in the countries, including Brazil, to uh, give us ideas and initiate collaborations either directly by getting, I should say, initiating research, either by getting direct money from the NIH through applying for a grant, or by partnering with other entities, including people who already have grants in the United States or in Brazil or anywhere, doing something else. It's easier to get money to somebody who already has money. Okay, here's some of the categories, epidemiology and pathogenesis. And I'm just, there's a, these are busy lists, but I just want to show you, I talked to some of our program people about grants that have already been given or are about to be given, and in these categories include eight clinical trial sites in Brazil being headed by a different institute from mine, the Child Health Institute, a prospective study, a natural history study in Nicaragua, uh, another natural history study in Brazil, and planned maternal studies. Over on the other side, a study in transfusion recipients, um, an experimental model of uh, Zika pathogenesis in pregnant primates in which a large number of rhesus macaques will be impregnated, presumably by other rhesus macaques, and um, we will study the natural, uh, they will be challenged with virus, 
and uh, see if they can be infected and follow the pathogenesis in them. Mouse models, um, pregnancy clinical networks in the regions, uh, and um, another mouse model. Now, our sister agency, CDC in Atlanta, is a much smaller organization, and their budget is uh, about 20% of ours, and their research budget is probably 5% of ours. So they don't have a lot of money, but they do a lot of good work. Um, and they're already working here in the region, have been for a long time, on diagnostics. And um, also, we are working on diagnostics, including RT-PCRs for uh, for different viruses in which you'd have one test, potentially a point-of-care test, that could be used to distinguish right there at the bedside whether a person had Zika, dengue, chikungunya, or none of the above. And then antibody assays that don't cross-react. This is a whole area. Those of you who've done serology like me know that um, one of the hardest problems with serologic tests for flaviviruses is they cross-react with everything. So anybody who's had dengue, anybody who's had a yellow fever vaccine, everybody who's had Rocio, on and on and on, they're going to have cross-reactions, and it's a problem to get rid of those. And I was talking to some colleagues at lunch. This is feasible to do. We can do it with the existing technology. It just hasn't been done. Vector control studies, vector competence, insecticides, and novel control methods, which might be um, uh, uh, male mosquitoes that, um, are, uh, that kill females, uh, Wolbachia, and various, any other ideas. Obviously, until the research gets going and until we uh, find ways to cure Zika or to prevent it, um, the quickest thing that can be done is to control the vectors. If we could get rid of mosquitoes, um, we could get rid of this epidemic. And let's not forget that uh, over 100 years ago, um, William Crawford Gorgas and other sanitarians eradicated Aedes aegypti from the Panama Canal Zone and eradicated Aedes aegypti from Havana, Cuba. So it could have been done. It was done 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. It could be done now, technically. The reasons it doesn't get done are more sociological and related to poverty and uh, disenfranchisement of people and so on. Here are some of the things that we've been funding in diagnostics. These are busy lists, but just look at them and see if you see anything that you're interested in, because these are things we're doing already, but there's other ideas and there's a lot of room for scientists to work and collaborate. Development of an ELISA, a better neutralization test, improved PCR probes, a multiplex PCR, um, rapid gene coding, and generation of Zika monoclonal antibodies both can, that can be used, uh, both humanized and, and monoclonal antibodies that could be used for therapy and other mouse and other monoclones that could be used in diagnostic as reagents. And then in vector control, Wolbachia studies, vector competence, insecticide repellent research, and larvicide treated adult male mosquitoes I just mentioned. In therapeutics, we're trying to develop in vitro antiviral screening assays, and we do this on a routine basis all the time. We, we actually have scientists who screen all sorts of natural products, thousands and thousands and thousands of them, against various viruses of interest. And now we're switching over to Zika to look for ideas that, um, uh, you know, that maybe come out of nowhere, like uh, happened in China 40 or so years ago, which gave us a new drug for malaria. Testing compounds with known activity against some viruses, against flaviviruses. This probably won't work, but it's worth doing. Broad screening of compounds without any known activity, and a targeted uh, antiviral approach in which structure-based design of a, th you know, knowing the structure of the glycoprotein, for example, and other proteins um, can allow us to specifically target a vaccine that fits it like uh, a hand and glove. Whoops, what did I do? Okay, on to vaccines. There are many, many projects. This is just two of them. Uh, we're trying to make, dengue, uh, uh, trying to make uh, Zika vaccines, including strategies used for dengue vaccines. One of them that was successful with West Nile virus, which is sort of closely related to Zika, is a DNA vaccine that turns into a virus-like particle. We're working on that, on that already. We should have at least a prototype of that vaccine very quickly. And a live attenuated vaccine Based on, the, um, by, based on the dengue vaccine that's being, I, I think, being studied right here now, or soon will be, uh, being, the vaccine's being made by Butantan, and it's being studied here in phase three trials. This is an NIH vaccine, 
and we've been working in partnership with uh, people here. So treatments, antiviral screening, rodent models. Well, another thing we do is we develop animal models. I mentioned a, a primate uh, a pregnancy model, a, a rhesus macaque pregnancy model. Also rodent models for testing uh, drugs and uh, therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. And then vaccine development, I mentioned some of those. And uh, the bottom one is another one, a VSV expressing Zika um, uh, envelope protein vaccine. The VSV is one of the same vaccines that was used to quickly make an Ebola vaccine last year. So we know, we think we know, we can get this working very quickly. And there's a number of other ideas as well. And then just basic research, molecular virology of structure, um, comparing viruses from different outbreaks, doing phylogenetic analyses. One, one of the more interesting things to me is to ask the question, since this virus has been around since 1947 and it never did anything, why is it doing all these things now? Is it just a coincidence? Or did something change in the virus or the vector or in people? Not likely something changed in people other than there are more people and we travel more. That's certainly a part of it. But it's also the possibility there's been a viral change. How do you determine that? Because the new virus here in Brazil and the old viruses in Southeast Asia and Africa are pretty similar. There are base changes here and there. And how do we know if any of those base changes or any combination of them relate to a new phenotypic property. This requires understanding the phylogeny and having an experimental model to look for pathogenic outcomes. A very, very big deal that's going to take years, but it's important to do. Studies on the immune response are important. We imagine the immune response is going to be analogous to other flaviviruses like dengue, but it has to be studied and establishing animal models. And then a whole bunch of other grants. I don't think I want to read down the list. There's just a lot of them. And this is not all. These are just a few that I picked off to sort of overwhelm you with the fact that we're funding, right now, we're funding hundreds, perhaps close to 1,000 people to work on Zika on various grants. And we're going to be funding more. Uh, we also have workshops. And um, we've had two already. Um, we've had teams come down here and meet uh, with fire crews in Hio. And um, we'll continue to work with anybody who wants to work with us. We're having another workshop coming up with, uh, this is probably a closed workshop because it's the BARDA people and they're sort of a secretive organization in Washington. But, um, but the point is that one of the things we do on, is we spend money on bringing together scientists. So I'm going to end right here because we're behind on time. But I just, I just want to say that NIH is doing a lot. We're going to do more. And if you have any interest in research and being funded by us, um, come and talk to me. I won't have the answers, but I can put you in touch with people who you can communicate with. Thank you.